Welcome, everyone, this morning. Thank you for joining us again for day two of our QIW 19. Uh, my name is Jim Mulshine, and I get to work with the Prevent Cancer Foundation um, in terms of being on the board. And uh, we had a delightful day yesterday, um, a remarkable uh, opportunity to recognize some contributions by the McKees that have been absolutely foundational to the success of the early implementation of screening. A variety of topics in terms of uh, what we need to do and where we have to go. And we're going to continue in that vein. Only today we're going to focus on the value of screening. And Dr. Ian Kalovitz and Andrea McKee have graciously agreed to help us with that. I'm going to start that in just a second. And I just want to let you know we also have a very exciting technical session that reviews the state of where we are in terms of AI development and tool development, in terms of streamlining and, and increasing the impact of screening. And then we're going to talk about um, our breakout groups to try to distill down to action plans for next year. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ian Kelovitz to kick off our opening session today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, I just wanted to uh, briefly say that I, I wanted to thank again the organizers for this meeting. Bo, Jody, uh, and Jim. Uh, this is uh, continues to be, for me at least, an exceptional meeting. You know, the diversity of disciplines that come together with passion to speak about these issues it's, and how it's lasted for so long has just been, uh, in my mind, pretty fantastic. Uh, and the sessions I'm about to present, uh, the first one uh, regarding uh, perceptions uh, of screening both in patients and clinicians, what do we know? Uh, and the second one, which you'll see on uh, health and wellness quantification. This was, again, just such an enlightening uh, experience for me. You know, I learned so much from these meetings and, and these meetings are not really about teaching so much as pushing the envelope. I think all the speakers learn as much uh, doing this as uh, they try to impart to the panelists. So. With that, I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, and this is, again, lung cancer screening perceptions, both in patients and clinicians, what do we know? And I think some of you heard what my feelings were yesterday uh, regarding why I think there hasn't been penetration of screening. Um, and I have, these are financial and research disclosures. Uh, these are the panelists for this session. I have uh, uh, Wendy Everett from Avalier, who I just worked on. Uh, on, on a project regarding shared decision-making, and she'll give some of her experience from that. Joelle Fati, who everybody knows with GoTo Foundation, who's personally been involved with lung cancer screening and, and taking care of patients. Tisa Flores, uh, who, who I've recently uh, become acquainted with from Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Andrea and uh, Providencia Morales, who, uh, runs the screening program out in Phoenix VA Medical Center, uh, who all have an enormous experience with lung cancer screening and interacting with patients and uh, or participants and clinicians. This has always struck me, this, this slide, this came from uh, the American College of Chest Physicians uh, right after lung cancer screening was approved. And, you know, and, and to me, this has all, at least I have always interpreted this as one of the prime reasons why lung cancer screening has not really reached the level of penetration that I would have liked to have seen. Uh, and I just want to point out, it says, quant, you know, this is, the, this is what they say to say to people. And I've presented this over the years. I've been sort of howling into the wind about this topic. Uh, but here, here it is. They say, talk about, tell your patients about the quality of the benefits uh, quantify the benefits, quantify the harms. And for quantifying the benefits, again, four out of people who are going to die of lung cancer will die even if they are screened. Screening prevents one in five deaths from lung cancer. It's just an extraordinary statement. Four to five times you're gonna die. And they quantify the harms and they talk about all the false positives. They talk about overdiagnosis and they present it as we can't tell if a cancer, and they quantify overdiagnosis, interestingly enough, as a slow growing cancer, and they say, can't tell whether it's slow growing or fast growing, no way to tell the difference. I don't know if Rick would say anything about that. Um, 
And then they talk about the radiation, but you know, the benefits probably better than the harms from the radiation. And this is what the conversation should be. And, and really, I don't think it's progressed much from there for many people, but this is still the, the overall attitude. And I just uh, explaining it, one out of five, if you were, destined to die, will die. Four to five times the cancer snuck through. By the way, if you believe this, the, um, the control arm for the PLCO with no, no screen, that was the chest X-ray, the control arm did better than four out of five. You had a better survival rate than this. So in essence, if you're getting lung cancer screening, this basically says you're gonna do worse than getting nothing at all. If you believe this sentence, it's just an incredible, I don't know how to say how, how misleading this is. I guess I've said it. And, and, and it, it has impact. This is the Harvard Medical blog. To keep one person from dying, 320 heavy smokers need screening, or put another way, 319 out of 320 will not benefit. You know, this doesn't sound like something I'm going to run, run up to and say, I want to sign me up. It, it just doesn't have that appeal to me. And it has impact. This is uh, the former uh, chief medical officer from the American Cancer Society. I'm committed to telling people the truth and letting people decide for themselves. Uh, this is Otis Brawley, but added, if he were a candidate for screening, don't think I would do it. You know, how much more of a, or lack of an endorsement do you get than that? And again, it, it just had enormous impact. This was point, this was shown to me uh, to look at this by Mary Ellen Geiger who's a, a medical physicist, a esteemed medical physicist. But you know, even in her world, she knew about this. She said, take a look at this. This is the implementation of some proceedings of a workshop from the Health Policy Forum, a National Cancer Policy Forum. And this was from the CMS. This is the basis for that. This is what they said, how they decided. The MedCAC concluded there was low confidence. We all were aware of that. And Instead, they specified a number of other criteria, and my, my slide is covered, but ultimately for, for, for Medicare, I can read it there. Ah. Instead, we have a number of specific criteria for coverage, probably more than our typical coverage decisions. For example, Medicare needs to participate, Medicare patients need to participate in counseling and shared decision making. It's, it's straight away. We have shared decision making because we don't think there's a real advantage, it's borderline. That was the message that was out there. And, and here's the rub, here's where I, I've, I've always felt. This is from that same meeting where they talk about um, LCAP basically. And Claudia Henschke has been saying for the past 15 years, we can cure 80% of the cancers that are found by screening, 80% curability. And these guys say, and it's not just Bach, uh, here you have Bach and Doug Wood, that they noted that estimate was much greater than the reduction seen with the NLST. So Claudia is saying we're curing 80%. They're saying the NLST had a 20%. It's the crux of the argument. There's nothing incompatible with saying that you can have 80% cure rate and have a clinical trial that has a 20% mortality reduction. Trial. So those clinical trials don't reflect the cure rate, what's really important. Those trials reflect the parameters of the trial, the number of rounds of screening and the length of follow-up. So that Claudia said there's an 80% cure rate is not incompatible with a clinical trial having a result. And, and that's where the rub is. But you see how, how impactful that is. Now that has always been to me a major uh, concern. And I wondered how much that impacted people who were interested in screening, and not only people interested, but organizations, um, physicians who are thinking of sending people for screening. And then, of course, there are many other issues that come up. You know, uh, how do they view this compared to other types of screening? Um, you know, what other factors might cause people not to get screened? How does all the other findings that we can make on screening impact people's willingness to be screened. So with that as a background, let's turn to some of our panelists. Um, first one is uh, Wendy Everett from Avalier. And she can talk about, because we tried to address some of these questions and Wendy, you can report. 
Uh, I was on mute. I hope I'm back on live now. Um, thank you, David. Uh, and we had a really fascinating study, uh, partly fueled, as you've just heard, by David's passion for making sure that both clinicians and patients understood the risks and the benefits so that they could make not just an informed consent decision, but a shared decision that would also take into account the patient's preferences and the patient's goals. Um, so Avalier Health worked with the lung cancer screening team at Mount Sinai. And the goal of our study was to elicit and understand both the patients and the clinicians ideas about and their attitudes toward shared decision making in deciding whether or not to undergo um, screening for lung cancer. So we framed shared decision making as more than um, informed consent. And that was a very interesting um, portion of the study that we did. So for this particular study, we used a structured interview guide, um, checked all of the cork boxes so that it could classify as um, a publishable qualitative research. And we interviewed 24 patients who'd been referred for lung cancer screening and 12 clinicians. So it was a nice combination, particularly in the clinicians of primary care docs and specialists. And um, what was fascinating to us was while the clinicians agreed that shared decision making was valuable and very important, they didn't, they just didn't do it. Um, and David has a, a probably more emphatic way of expressing this as, as we did the study together. But for a variety of reasons, ranging from they didn't have time, if the PCPs only had 20 minutes uh, to do a physical, uh, they just, this was not on the top of their list. Um, some of them felt that the patients really wouldn't understand uh, what they were talking about, particularly when we get into these more complicated and as David just described, very conflicting data points. Um, so I'm going to share my screen um, and just quickly walk through what our findings were. There we go. Okay. So of the patients that we interviewed, um, almost half of them said that they're clinician had just not discussed anything about lung cancer screening with them at the time that they made the decision to have lung cancer screening. So at some place down the road, once they showed up to get their screen, they did have a short interview with a nurse practitioner. But if we're thinking about the importance of a clinician and a patient being able to discuss these harms and benefits that David mentioned, it, it just wasn't happening. And the patients, some of the comments from the patients were, all I know is he said, I have to take this. Um, when we said, to what degree, and we really probed on this, uh, did your clinician talk to you about the benefits of lung cancer screening. No, she didn't. She just looked at my age. She looked at my history and she said, you've got to do this. She stated it quite firmly. So uh, again, I think sometimes we underestimate the power of that relationship that the patients have with the clinicians. Um, the, the patients would say to me, I got it done because I'm a smoker. My doctor wanted to make sure that my lungs are fine. Um, and finally, I don't think anyone really talked to, to me about what was involved. 
so what was what was really interesting was that um, essentially the patient said, I got a lung cancer screening because my doctor told me to. I trust my doctor. He or she said I should do this. I didn't ask any questions. I wasn't given any information, but I did it. So at a, a high level across these three important pieces, understanding the benefits and the harms, reasons, expressing their reasons for participating or not participating, and really at the um, core of this, the lack of the standard definition of a shared decision making were very important. Um, the, if we go quickly to the benefits and the harms, um, both patients and clinicians understood those benefits and those harms. Um, but when we talked about why would you choose to participate or not, um, the benefits and the harms didn't really have as much effect on the patient's decision as the physician's statement that you should or should not have this. And that emerged when we talked to the patients about what is shared decision making. Um, most of the patients said they did not have this shared decision making conversation and there was no general understanding of what it really was. Now, when I say that the patients and the clinicians understood the benefits, um, what was interesting to us is that there was a lot of congruence between them. Um, the patients, for the patients, very early detection and the opportunity to cure this uh, was important. They understood it. Um, certainly the clinicians did, 75% of them focused on the importance of lung cancer screening as providing that early detection and ability to cure. The patients were a little more interested in comorbidities and valued the fact that lung cancer screening might also let them know that they had COPD, that they might have another um, cardiac issue that wouldn't have been discovered otherwise. Um, and I think that the patients also believed they gained more from the shared decision-making process in terms of learning about um, health education in general. Although I will say it didn't seem to affect their ability to stop smoking. Um, the factors that really influence their decision to participate in this above and beyond um, the uh, physician saying so was that, let me go back, um, they had, uh, they knew they had high risk factors for lung cancer, um, all of them talked about their history of smoking, any comorbidities they had, and the family um, history was very important to them. My, they lost their mother a couple of years ago. Both of their parents were smokers. Um, their sister got cancer. The patients were very forthcoming with us, and these constellations of factors that they smoked that they had COPD, COPD um, that their family had a history, were much more important than the affordability. So kind of one of our hypotheses was that the cost would be um, really important. So kind of, kind of as I, I close, what it is that the patients um, really want to know is information on the process of lung cancer screening. So this is really much more in the uh, area of benefits and harms. 
So they want to know exactly what will happen during the screening. Um, they want to know what happens if, if I test positive in the lung cancer screening. What are the next steps then? So kind of harms and benefits around radiation, around a biopsy that may have a complication, um, kind of the risk of getting lung cancer in the near term versus the long term, and then what the treatment options would be were really the things that were important to the patients. Um, and in the discussion section, David, maybe you and I can talk a, a little bit more about what was important to the physicians. Um, but our, our takeaway from this, what we really learned, is that when we presented the patients with the numbers that David went through in, in the introduction, um, kind of this one out of five, 20%, 80%, Every single patient but one said, even if those numbers were correct and four out of five people would die, they would still go ahead and have the screening. And they would have it because when I probed, um, they believed that whatever was learned would contribute to science. And if they had been a smoker and they potentially had lung cancer and they could contribute to science, they wanted to do so. So we had, we discovered this rather dramatic disconnect between the clinicians doing almost no uh, shared decision making or having no shared decision making. Uh, discussions with their patients and at the same time their patients when presented with this information wanted to go ahead with the test uh, because of this altruistic reason. So let me stop there just with that short, very short summary of our two and a half year study. And David, thank you for this opportunity to present our results and turn it back to you. Thank, thank you, Wendy. Uh, okay, the next uh, speaker or panelist is Joelle Fati. Joelle, do you have any comments to make at this point? I have a lot of comments. <laughs> I want to give some background, a little bit of context here. So um, some people know where I've been in my career and some people don't. But 25 years ago, when I became a nurse practitioner, I started working in internal medicine. And I worked in IM for the upwards of a decade. And then I went into specialty care. And that's when I entered the thoracic oncology world. And, you know, in 2010, started a tobacco related diseases and lung cancer screening program. And that was really foundationally based on the way I designed it was really kind of from a primary care perspective. And I'm also trained as a tobacco treatment specialist. And this uh, this unique um, program had fully integrated tobacco cessation services. But again, it was really kind of framed within the primary care lens. Um, and I have since taken a full-time job at GoTo and have stepped away from thoracic oncology, and I'm back in the IM world. And it's been fascinating to be a mystery shopper, given my background and now being back in a, a very busy internal medicine practice. And so, you know, it's it's really interesting to hear Dr. Everett's um, results from this study to be back on the front lines of clinical healthcare and uh, being reminded of what reality is um, on the front lines of primary care. And somewhat being a mystery shopper um, in that setting, you know, coming from the perspective I have uh, in the screening world. Um, you know, I, in preparation for our time today, I went out and kind of looked at the literature again to really kind of revisit what I thought I already knew about reality. And if you go back and, and really kind of look at the literature in terms of primary care perceptions and what they know and what they don't know, um, it, it's a lot of the same stuff that we've known for the last decade and a half since lung cancer screening really kind of 
um, hit prime time. Um, one of the things that really kind of bubbled up for me in the literature was the fact that um, uh, presence of comorbidities influences decisions by primary care providers around whether or not they offer lung cancer screening or if they're compelled to have that shared decision-making conversation with patients. I will say that um, uh, the areas that I think there's a paucity of um, attention um, in our field that we need to pay attention to based on my, my experience as a primary care provider is that we're not paying enough attention to um, healthcare delivery and current reality, pragmatic issues around um, what primary care providers are faced with and how we're going to effectively insert um, lung cancer screening in, in that setting. And it's interesting, um, and I'm kind of bouncing around here, but you know, some of the common themes out there is that if primary care providers have awareness about the guidelines and they've been educated on how to perform shared decision making, they do it. There's a correlation. And um, and there was an interesting study by uh, Volche at um, Morehouse in Atlanta in the School of Medicine, where they actually went and looked at a really large um, um, database of patients who were eligible for screening based on their EHR, and they had a 45% uptake of lung cancer screening. Um, but this, and so that's that's so much higher than what we know is going on um, uh, uh, collectively across the country. But that um, health system has a real emphasis on educating um, and providing shared decision-making time for their, their providers. So I think there's something to learn there because reality is that our healthcare delivery systems are not positioning primary care providers to do this work. Um, I, I must tell you, my first week on the job re-entering IM, the upwards of 10 patients an hour. It's insanity. It's absolute insanity. And uh, working in a large provider office where there's 10 of us at any given time sharing a space. And my first week on the job, I had someone who um, who was who qualified for screening. And I walked in the provider office and said, hey, um, can someone you know share with me what the workflow is here? How do I get someone lung cancer screening? And the reception was terrible. And one person turned around at me and looked at me and said, oh, you don't want to do that. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is reality. This is what we're faced with. Um, it's a burden, but but it's fascinating. And I'll close with my comments uh, thus far with what Dr. Everett just presented. Um, the harms, benefits, the treatment options, the info on lung cancer, risk of lung cancer in the min in near term, info on process and next steps. All of these things are no different than what I do for colorectal cancer screening, for prostate cancer screening, for mammogram. These are all exactly the same things that I have a duty and I do conversed with my patients about for all of these other things. And so I'll close my comments right now to this, which is unfortunately by in my humble opinion, by calling out shared decision-making in the lung cancer screening process, we have done ourselves a, a disservice because it's really no different than what we should and are doing, but because we've called it out for some reason, it's created this burden in our health systems and in our providers' minds. Um, anyway, I, I just, um, we have so much more work to do and yet, maybe we are making it more complex than we need to. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's, it's making it tougher. So anyway, I'll throw, I'll just stop right there. Thank you, Joelle. Uh, our, our next panelist is Dr. Tisa Flores from Roswell Park. And I just want to say, Tisa, that, uh, that, that her team really en enlightened me recently uh, about something I was really unaware of. And that is, how, how clinicians think about all of this information that they're getting and, and how that impacts them in their busy practice. I know that's an important topic and Tisa will be able to address some of that. But anyway, 
Thank you. Actually, Thank you. this is excellent that I get to go right after Dr. Fadi. I am an internist and pediatrician by training. Um, and I came to Roswell as their screening and survivorship uh, medical director. And my team, we just got uh, New York State's first mobile CT for lung cancer screening. And just trying to navigate that. Um, I also remember the all the things that primary care doctors have to do. So we have, if we're lucky, 30 minutes for an annual physical. We have to screen them for depression. We have to ask them for HIV. We have to give them immunizations. And then we also do the screenings and the preventive things. That is our agenda. And the patients have their own agenda. Uh, and just trying to figure out how to make that all happen in the 30 minutes that we have, if we're lucky to have 30 minutes. You know, we are supposed to do med reconciliation. We have to check the box saying that we did med reconcile. There are many things on the primary care doctor's plates that may put lung cancer screening on the lower end. Uh, there's this big push for colorectal. We all want to get to 80%. You know, New York is doing, I think we're at 60%. So we are already uh, ahead of the bar but we don't have sort of a threshold to get us there. Um, we have, uh, the primary care doctors have incentives to make sure that their patients get mammograms, uh, pap smears, uh, colorectal cancer screening. Is that what we need to do to get us to uh, lung cancer screening? I'm not saying that's what we need to do. I mean, ultimately it comes down to is that we need the time to talk to our patients to talk about why we should get this test and what these tests mean, right? Um, I, I am aggressive at uh, lung cancer screening just because of the patient population I serve. Um, I have found several breast, uh, lung cancer screenings and breast cancers. Um, and I have many cancer survivors decline the testing uh, because they don't wanna do another test. They don't wanna know if there's another cancer. Um, and they just don't want to have to do more screening, more appointments. Um, I do have like a few slides, but basically what comes down to it, um, in, in Erie County, um, if I look at it, it looks like lung cancer, um, deaths from Erie County is 22 to 63%. For cardiovascular disease, it is 207. So it, it, in the primary care world, we're looking at um, screening for lung cancer or controlling their high blood pressure, their high cholesterol, their diabetes, because we know that 207 people are going to die versus you know, the 50. So as primary care doctors, that's what we're looking at. And the other thing that I see here is we find a lot of things not lung cancer related in these CT scans. We catch thyroid nodules, we catch abdominal, abdominal aortic aneurysms or thoracic aneurysms, and who is going to follow up on those exams. You know, that's something that we talked about with this uh, low dose CT. Um, one of the guys said, like, let's just uh, open up to and have it on the Erie County. And what comes down to it is like, we need to make sure that we aren't causing more segmented care. Like if these patients do not have primary care doctors, you know, us as a cancer institution can't just look at this person and say, oh, they have lung nodules and, um, you know, not concerning one year follow up, but there's a triple A that is three centimeters and not address that, then we're actually not doing the patient population uh, any service. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox and I'll let someone else talk. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tisa. You know, I hadn't heard this before. I'm always, as the radiologist, I've always been looking at. Uh, you know, what's the next 
advanced image processing thing where you're going to measure and give this great information to the clinicians and they're going to and and i you know these guys really enlightened me that you know this this is uh not as simple you know this kind of information requires a lot follow-up and it creates a lot of challenges so it's more important than i had previously understood our next panelist is dr mckee uh andrea take it away okay uh, thank you. I have a few thoughts about this. Um, you know, you, you spoke about the confusion um, and emphasis on the harms. And of course, um, one of the things that we've worked really hard to try to correct is the 96% false positive rate, um, which is was a major issue and I think is getting better now, hopefully. But, um, you know, at Leahy, we, we, in the very beginning, before we launched the program, met with all of our providers and went over the data for lung screening. We provided them with a four-page FAQ that every patient was given and essentially taught them how to have the conversation with patients about this screening, what it was. We felt at that time that was really important because we were offering it as a community benefit with no charge to patients. And we knew there was going to be some interest because of the free screening and that providers needed to be prepared to handle all that. So we made a, a, a this concentrated effort to make sure that they understood what screening was, why we were offering it for free, how to talk to patients about it, what was the accurate information. And we estimate that we've screened about 65 to 70% of our eligible patient um, group. And so I think that that the attitudes that providers have when talking to patients, I mean, clearly based on the, the, the data that you presented here is very important. And if providers feel that this is something that is beneficial to their patients and communicate that to their patients, then you know, the majority of patients will be screened. That's at least the test case that, that we see at Leahy. Um, but you know, it took a lot of work to meet with everyone and educate them about what was going on. We never advertised directly to patients. We weren't allowed to for compliance reasons. So every patient that was referred to us was referred to us by their primary care physician. Um, the patients weren't made aware that we were offering free screening. It was, we just wanted to take away that barrier between the patient and the provider. And so I believe the majority of people actually when presented with information that's correct, not 96% false positive rates and uh, you know, four out of five people are going to die, will um, want to be screened. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess we're having some audio visual issues. Um, I recall uh, one time, I, and we do, we continue to meet with providers because new providers obviously come and old providers go. And so we have to continue to um, offer grand rounds and educate patients. And a couple of years into the program, I was giving an update and doing grand rounds. And, and one of our pulmonologists who is very influential and involved with screening, but is also very involved with, um, you know, some of his organizations that shall not be named, um, you know, got up and in the, at the end said that there was this 96% false positive rate. And as much as I did not want to, you know, take that on with this provider because he's very well respected in the community and screening, I just couldn't let that go. I just couldn't let that stay. So I, I had to say, no, actually this is incorrect. And, you know, um, the false positive rate for screening is really less than 10% in the initial round, and it goes down to 5% thereafter, which is comparable, if not better, to what we see in breast cancer screening. So um, it, it's, I believe provider education is the way we're gonna get there and that we need a national education campaign that will do basically what we did um, at Leahy and make sure people are comfortable having shared decision-making conversations, which by the way, like some, Doctors don't really understand that. Some doctors and I, you know, who have been practicing for a long time are much more used to telling their patients what to do and not having this conversation. So even just that concept really had to be um, taught to people. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. You know, uh, 
A lot to learn from uh, the way uh, they've run their program or ran their program up at Leahy. They have one of the most um, uh, successful in terms of enrolling eligible patients or participants. Yeah, um, I just want to say this week we've screened over um, 11, 10,000 patients and we've performed 25,000 scans. So um, it's a pretty active program. Yeah, and, and the proportion of people you've reached that are eligible is is very impressive. So there's a lot to learn from the approach that they've taken in terms of reaching out. Uh, our next uh, panelist is Providencia Morales. I'm not used to calling her Providencia because she's more affectionately known as Peewee. But Peewee's at uh, Phoenix VA and they have a, a really fascinating screening program where they reach out to patients. They, they use the sort of the, the pull method where they they find who's eligible, potentially eligible, and then they contact those people directly to get them in rather than waiting for physicians. So it's a wonderful uh, approach. And this way that gives them a lot of control in terms of, you know, volumes of patients they, they you know, and, and who they reach out to. So Peewee, you can uh, share some of your thoughts. So I'm Providencia Morales, and I'm the program manager for the Phoenix VA Lung Screening and Surveillance Program, program. and I'm going to share with you just a little brief overview about our program. So next slide, please. Thank you. So our program, we start with training, uh, just like a few of the providers here had, had spoken about. We begin with training. I think it's critical, and it's this leads to the success of our program. We start with our people, and that's our lung cancer screening coordinators. They receive training in conducting precision outreach, they uh, as well as on all the elements of shared decision-making and ensuring that they're consistent in their um, language with that and appropriate documentation in the electronic medical record is done, including documentation of, we get the history from our veterans on their employment history, their family history of lung cancer, and all the elements of smoking history and conducting a brief smoking cessation counseling. Uh, we train them on executing the referrals that may go to behavioral health for smoking cessation, referrals to our pulmonary clinic for um, any uh, suspicious nodules. Our team meets often our lung screening and surveillance clinic, it's a telephone clinic, so our coordinators work remotely. We have a weekly teams huddle where we discuss things such as, are they struggling getting results back timely? M maybe there's some cases they wanna discuss and they wanna bring forward to our case reviews. Perhaps they have some scheduling issues with radiology or any new training that may be needed. We keep it like an open forum. We provide our training uh, on resources that are available to us um, and for the program, as well as training our research service, our sir, I'm sorry, our resources services. And those services would include like our community care nurses. Um, it's important that they know where to locate supporting documentation in the EMR for that external screening order reimbursement, ensuring the visits are appropriately coded um, they also report back to us on the status of any outside orders, and they uh, we partner with them on timely returning uh, timely returning of the imaging reports from these external agencies. We also train um, our informatics services on what we desire and need for our program, as well as they help us in developing the electronic processes between our electronic medical record and our LCAP lung cancer screening management system. Um, there also are resources for updating our note templates, templates and any programmatic electronic medical record issues we have. So we have a, a tight partnership with our informatics team. And of course, our primary care providers, we also train them on who we are, what we do, and how we can help. Um, they also receive training on how to order an electronic request for lung cancer screening. Um, so we train both our veterans and our uh, healthy vet coordinator um, 
because we want to make sure that our veterans are aware of all the resources they can have to hopefully engage a little more in their health. So we let them know that we'll be referring them to My Healthy Vet Coordinator to register to that portal to have access to their electronic medical record, informing them that they have um, access to their records. They can send messages to their uh, primary care teams. I think it just helps keep them engaged in their health. Next screen, please. So the connection, we make that connection. That's our initial visit with the veteran. It's conversational. We let them know who we are and why we're calling. Often our patients are, they're embarrassed of their smoking habits. They're often apologetic. They feel marginalized because of their history of smoking. So we kind of break the ice. We let them know that we're non-judgmental. We're here to help them on their journey to smoking abstinence. And that if they're not yet ready to quit, that does not preclude them from screening. We also let them know uh, what to expect and when to expect results back. We give them our contact information. We let them know who our team is. And more importantly, we net let them know that we're partnering with their primary care provider, that everything we discuss is documented in their record. Their primary care provider is aware that we're tracking and we're coordinating their care for lung cancer screening. So we essentially walk them through the whole process, the imaging, the results, the follow-up, smoking cessation resources if applicable. Uh, we conduct a brief smoking cessation um, at every single encounter we have with our participants. And if agreeable, we make that immediate connection during that visit to our behavioral health psychologist for smoking cessation interventions. <clears throat> we go over what to expect after screening. And of course, we place the CT imaging order uh, and schedule that for them at the end of the visit and answer any questions they may have. So it is, it is a pretty long visit. It may take anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, just depending on the information that they desire and questions they may have. Next screen, please. So the voice of the veterans. Um, our coordinators are nurses and they're trained on active listening. Everyone has a story. Um, they have our patients have their own beliefs, their own values, and we respect their choices and their decisions. So we encourage smoking cessation at each encounter and we educate them on the best way to reduce their risk of developing lung cancer is quitting. And we know that they'll have relapses and that smoking cessation, it is a journey. So we let them know that we have resources that they're available through our team when they're ready to quit. Next screen, please. So the retention, so we have about a 71% ret retention adherence at uh, the second and third year rounds. Um, we started screening ro robustly about 2018. Um, and we attribute that to building a relationship of caring and trust at the initial, vis at the initial visit. Um, we let our patients know they will receive a call post imaging from the coordinator with results, not a letter. And we try to get back to them about a week after imaging. I think it's also important to let them know screening's not diagnostic and it's not urgent. Um, help them to, you know, to reduce some anxiety. We also let them know at the initial visit that if we have no prior comparator image, the first image of their lung, it's like a new landscape to us, not to be alarmed if we ask them to come back for a short three or six month follow-up. And at the result visits, we not only provide results of the screening within the lungs, but we give, we again, ask them about their smoking status. And if they're still smoking, provide them again, brief smoking cessation counseling. We strongly encourage at this follow-up visit, the abstinence and encourage them to, um, we can encourage them to uh, see behavioral health for counseling and the importance of coming back for annual screening. Uh, we talk about if any suspicious findings, we'll discuss with them the plan and we coordinate the care with pulmonary if needed. Uh, we notify them also of any other findings such as emphysema, their cardiac calcium score. We may go over diet, exercise, and if they're on a statin, we encourage them to keep taking it as prescribed. So we discuss next imaging and the time frame for the next imaging and schedule their follow-up appointment at, at that time. Next slide, slide, please. So it does take a team 
it does take time. We receive on average about seven new consults a day. So we couldn't do this without our team. Our team includes the veteran or participants, our informatics services, behavioral health, our primary care providers. We need to get their support in order to make that shared decision and that trust with that patient. Our community care nurses, that's really important that they know where to find information so that they can justify the reimbursement on these outside exams. And we encourage almost, we engage almost daily with our core team. And our core team involves Lori Murphy. She's our lung cancer screening coordinator, our pulmonologist, Dr. Sam Aguayo, and our PA, Kevin Kuffner. And of course, our amazing radiologist, Dr. Brian Eigel and Dr. Ryan Slaughter. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Pee Wee. Um, we are running a bit late, so I wanna just throw, a, I had a few questions planned, but uh, I'm gonna cut that down and I just want some sort of quick feedback from each of the panelists. Um, and I'll, I'll ask a few questions. Uh, first, just a sense, how do physicians and participants feel about lung cancer screening compared to other types of screening? You know, they think it's as important as breast screening or colorectal screening. Just any of the panelists chime in. Just briefly, do you all do you all think it's they they view it the same, equally important, or do they think one less than the other? Yeah, I think what we found, um, David, in our study was that uh, the physicians found it um, kind of 50 50. It was it was as important as colonoscopies or mammographies, um, whereas the patients thought it was more important. Um, kind of they they kind of wandered off occasionally into the fact that it was less invasive and a little bit easier to do, particularly as compared to a colonoscopy. Um, but they the patients thought it was more important than the physicians did. Hi, this is Providence. Yeah, um, and I was, initially when we started um, with the program, lung cancer screening was fairly new, um, and there were many more questions than we're hearing now. I think uh, hmm. there's more information out there in the public. Patients are much more comfortable, and now they see that um, you know it is similar to the other preventative screenings, and they're more likely to to agree to participate. They don't have as many questions as I recall them having in the past when it was much more new to them and to our providers. Hi, Andrea. Is this working out? Yeah, I just wanna make the comment that I think that uh, implementation is a local phenomenon. And so it really depends on how lung screening was implemented in your area. So um, if, if physicians are educated and know the actual facts about lung screening, then their attitudes are very different um, to, to a place somewhere where they're hearing all of this misinformation. Um, so locally is where we have to act to implement. Okay, Joelle or Tisa, do you wanna make a comment? Yeah, sure, I would just say that I, at the end of the day, I think primary care providers, um, if you look at the literature, they definitely see lung cancer screening as just as important as the other screenings. Um, I would say on a local level, they don't feel like they have the tools in place to manage the um, all the thoracic and extra thoracic findings. Um, so I think really focusing on um, how we build our systems to support them in that. And they don't always know they feel uneasy about uh, how to interpret um, the actual results, like the coronary artery calcium scoring. And um, so that's that's a whole nother conversation for today or another day. But I think it's important to understand that if we if we give it to them on a silver platter, if we iron out, as Dr. McKee says, um, on the back end implementation, um, and, and just give them a, a pragmatic workflow, they're more likely to adopt it. Just Lisa, let, before, you, before, you, before you answer, I just wanted to say, I wanted to, my next question was gonna be related to all those additional findings and whether that's viewed as a benefit or a harm, you know, by the clinician. So fold in your answer to how it's viewed about screening, other screenings, and also 
whether there's value to all the other information that we're giving and how the clinicians and participants view that. You made me take a, a big sigh. Uh, recently, we just did this. Um, we did a lung cancer screening on a cancer survivor and we found a thyroid nodule, which then um, made us do the thyroid ultrasound, which was then questionable. And then we got the thyroid biopsy and it was just hyperplastic. Um, yes, uh, cancer screening is definitely something that we should be aggressively going after. Um, it's just as important as cervical mammogram, colon. Um, I think the extra thing um, when we find the incidental lomas, the thyroids, the adrenal nodules, the triple A's, um, I think it's important that if a, another entity is getting this imaging that is actually relayed back to the primary care doctor, I think one of the hardest things, especially since I'm no longer in the primary care role, will order stuff and will fax it or they can go on, but we have something called Healthy Link where the primary care doctor can take a look at the imaging. But since the primary care doctor did not order it, we cannot assume that they will follow it um, because they weren't the ordering physician. And that's what that worries me about all the, um, Roswell included, having this uh, mobile CT scanning people. We're gonna find these other things. How are we going to communicate to their primary care doctor that this needs to be followed up? I do a lot of calling my colleagues because I have a lot of people's cell phones in my cell phone, but that is not, that's not, that cannot work for everyone. And let's go back to the patient. Um, I think the patients are asking more for lung cancer screening because not just in the last decade, it was a death sentence, right? People would get lung cancer and then they would, they'd be dead right. in the year, right? And now you hear more people living uh, from their lung cancer. And so patients also have a different perception of lung cancer and, you know, can we survive it? But um, we, we will need, as a medical community, we will need to figure out how to help the primary care uh, providers with um, nodule management, but all the other things, because, um, you know, they, for a long time, they were like, you know, don't look at carotid arteries and, you know, what happens if we see calcifications, exactly like Dr. Fahey said, you know, we, we comment that they have severe uh, calcifications, then what, you know, I hope that they are on a statin aspirin and see their cardiologist, but what happens if they're in a place in rural America that doesn't have a cardiologist and who needs to own that then? Mm -hmm. Thanks for your time. Okay, I think uh, this session is really out of time. Uh, so I think I'm just gonna wrap it up. Rowena, was there any burning question from the audience? No. No, okay. So then then let's, let's call it a day. Thank you all the participants for this uh, enlightening session and uh, great, we'll move on. Great. Okay, the next session is the intersection of health and wellness quantification and early disease management. Uh, and, you know, where I just want to start this session by making a, a very brief comment. Uh, you know, um, you can't. Uh, you can't miss every day seeing, whether it's in a magazine or uh, on television, what the latest uh, measure of health is and what you should be doing and how you should be you know, quantifying your health. Um, it's really becoming uh, quite a, I don't know, industry, uh, but it's, it's, it's in, in, in people's mind now. People are really thinking about this. And so I wanted to get a sense of if I was a person, you know, average consumer out there, how would I go about finding out what, uh, what's the best measure of whether I'm a healthy person or not? So I asked one of our research uh, associates in our program, Sydney Cantor, to, uh, to take a look, see, see just do, do a search uh, and see what, the, what you might find if you were a 
average person looking on the internet to find out if you're healthy and what you might want to measure and do at home. So she she did that, and we're going to start off by by showing the results of of her you know sort of informal uh, look at how at how she would potentially measure health. So can we play uh, the? Hi, I'm Cindy Cantor. Today we are going to be talking about measures of health. I have no financial disclosures. The main objective of this talk is to conduct an online search for quantitative measures of health. So what the average person would find if they wanted to measure their own health. I searched terms fairly vaguely at first, like measures of health. And then I added in more specific words like home, women's health, men's health, common metrics, health check, easy health. And I put together a list of the most common outcomes besides go to the doctor and get your blood work checked. The most common output I found were weight measurements. BMI was on just about every list and is one we're a bit more familiar with. Higher BMI puts one at risk for heart disease, high blood pressure, and many more. Part of the reason BMI is such a popular output is because for every one article that recommends BMI, there is another regarding the flaws of calculating BMI, including that it overestimates the BMI in a more muscular build and underestimates the BMI in a more frail build. Which leads to our next measurement of waist circumference or measuring the ratio between your hips and your waist. More fat around one's waist rather than hips puts you at risk for diseases like heart disease and type two diabetes with risk increasing according to waist size. So a waist size of greater than 35 inches for women puts them at risk and greater than 40 inches for men. The next most common measure recently became popular over the summer is the 10 second balance test. It was published in the New York Times, the Irish Times and NBC News, but it all stemmed from an article that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Successful 10 second one legged stance performance predicts survival in middle aged and older individuals. So the article was first published in June 2022 in the British Journal of Sports Medicine and basically says that the inability to balance is associated with a twofold risk of death from any cause within 10 years and then strength and balance tend to decrease rather quickly after the mid 50s resulting in frailty. And both the research and the articles recommend balance training as it affects both longevity and quality of life. And balance can be inspected by other things besides frailty, like cataracts, as well as the slowing of nerve signals from feet to brain. So the Wall Street Journal recently came out with the five do-it-yourself tests, including the one-legged standing tests, but also including four more tests that you can do at home. The first of which is the sit-to-stand test, which is basically you calculate how long it takes you to go from sitting in an armless chair to standing up. It evaluates lower extremity strength and long-term health and calculates the average time per age category, how quickly you should be able to do that. Next is the push-up test, which is useful for measuring your musculoskeletal health. Male participants, average age of 40, who are unable to complete 10 push-ups were at a significantly higher risk for cardiovascular disease compared to men who can do greater than 40 push-ups. Then there is the six minute walk test, which has also become fairly popular at home measurement over the summer, but basically how far you can walk in six minutes as a measure of cardiovascular and lung health. And if it's under 350 feet, that can indicate other health issues. And lastly, the cognitive test that they offer is the self-administered gyrocognitive exam. And it's an at-home 10 to 15 minute test that helps detect early signs of cognitive memory or thinking impairments. Um, this test can be done digitally and you'll get your results right at the end, or if you choose to do it on pen and paper, you would have to review the results, the results with your PCP. Next up, a bit onto the tech side of, how, of home health measurements. So smartwatches are by no means new and can track many health related aspects of our day-to-day -day lives like step count and active minutes per day. But there were many articles, including the CNET one that I posted on the side, that recommends smartwatches for measuring heart rate variability, which is the amount of time between each heartbeat. The values needed to calculate HRV are your resting heart rate, your max heart rate, exercise information, and sleep patterns, which are all collected by the smartwatch. Overall, the claim is that higher HRV means a healthier lifestyle and gives insight into the overall fitness levels and how your, well your body responds to stressors. Lastly, smart scales that go just beyond weight measurements, which were widely recommended in a variety of women's health magazines. So first, what they calculate is bone mass. So low bone mass increases risk of fractures and increased bone density helps reduce osteoporosis. 
They also calculate total body water percentage. So the measure of extracellular water, too much extracellular water may indicate possible malnutrition, heart, liver, or kidney disease. They also matter, measure body fat percentage. So lower percentage of body fat is indicative of better health while a higher percentage puts one at greater risk for cardiovascular disease, as we discussed earlier. And lastly, they calculate muscle mass. So higher muscle mass increases metabolic rate, prevents falls, and can protect against developing diabetes. So next steps. We're going to see in our panels how technology and imaging measure similar health indicators, including overall fitness, frailty, body measurements, and body composition. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, my slides are up. So I, I just have to say that uh, I had a lot of fun preparing this session. This was really interesting to me. You know, what stimulated it all was, you know, all of the other information we can get out of these low dose CT scans of the chest, you know, and, and we're really talking about measuring muscle mass and quality of muscle and fat distributions and how that impacts overall health. And we realized that there's a lot of ways of doing this. Um, and so we wanted to know, you know, what we could do on, on a general health basis. And since I have no shame, uh, I had a lot of fun preparing this. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, these are my uh, financial and research disclosures again. Uh, here are panel members uh, for this talk. And I, it's really... Uh, somebody's ringing. Okay, um, we have uh, uh, Mirza Faisal Beg, who is uh, the, the Chief Executive Officer of Veroni Health Analytics. Uh, we have Susan Freed, who's over at Mount Sinai in the Obesity and Metabolism Institute, who's really an expert on, on fat metabolism. And Raj Serene, who's the uh, CEO of Staiku, which you'll hear more about. Uh, and I'll just show a few slides. You know, you can't go to a scale. This is obviously a hypothetical person, uh, but you can see that, it, you know, it's not just when you go to a scale, you don't just get weight anymore. You get BMI, body fat, uh, entire fat, skeletal muscle, subcutaneous, visceral fat, body water, muscle mass, et cetera. And, and, and then what these scales do is they allow you to not only see, you know, what that number is, but where you are. Uh, in, in terms of you know what what a range is for health or not health, I mean it's the amount of information out there and the ability to quantify it here uh, the type of uh, uh, you know visceral fat what where where people fit you know is it good high low etc. So so this kind of quantitative information is there and it I think it motivates people uh, now how accurate this is and all that we'll we'll hear a little bit more about um, this is just your bath, typical bathroom scale. This is something new. This you'll hear more about. I don't want to steal thunder from uh, uh, Staiku, but this is, this is obviously the idealized male physique. Um, and uh, and uh, <laughs> But you, know, you can see the kinds of measures that it can make. And I, I won't go into too much, but I, I spoke to clinicians who use this now in there, and this is in an office that's zero radiation and, and how useful it is. And, and, and the old adage of an image is, a picture is worth a thousand words. I can't tell you how much they said this is so impactful for patients who can't believe that this is them, that this is what they look like. And, and it motivates them to want to get in shape, lose weight, uh, you know, that, that they find that this is an incredible motivator more than any other tool. And I said, what else do you use? What else, what other things do you use to measure health? And it's the usual blood tests, but that this kind of test and this approach. Now we have this ability also with lung cancer screening. Every time we do a CT scan, we potentially can produce complementary. This offers, you know, sort of a surface area, look at what people have, but you know, you can combine this with some of the impedance techniques that you get for muscle mass, et cetera. And you really learn a lot. And here also the idea of being able to take a, you know, certain values that you get from this test and compare it to a general population or different populations, this stuff is really valuable. And I think it is highly motivating for people to use. Uh, anyway, so 
with that, uh, I'll, I'll turn to our panelists. Uh, first is uh, Faisal. Hi, hi, David. <clears throat> hi, everyone. Thank you, David, for the opportunity to present uh, to this panel today. I'm really excited and delighted to be here from Vancouver, Canada. Let me start sharing my screen. Um, so here's my screen. I hope people can see it. Um, just have it away. And here are my slides. I'm going to present these slides. So uh, my talk is on AI-based automation. Um, as uh, David, you're mentioning, a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, probably a million words with the with the amount of information that's in CT images. Um, so a background about me, uh, I'm a professor here in the School of Engineering Science at Simon Fraser University <clears throat> in Vancouver, Canada. I'm also the Chief Scientific Officer of Voronoi Health Analytics, uh, and here's the website. And what I'm going to talk about is, you know, they have CT scanners, they generate amazing images, the images come out, and what can we do quantitatively from these images uh, in addition to the diagnosis and the screen for lung cancer? And so I'm going to highlight uh, our, our efforts to build something that can be quantitative for prognosis, for predicting adverse events in the future, for progression monitoring of organs and tissues, and essentially laying the groundwork for precision medicine, which is the right treatment for the right individual, the right dose at the right time. So as we all know, uh, you know there's this complex interplay between the disease, uh, the host, and the intervention. We want to know how much disease the individual has. So staging the tumor and where the tumor is is really important. Uh, we also then want to understand uh, how much host there is, like how much muscle and fat there is, and, and what are the constellation of body habitus in this individual, because the interplay of these two decide the correct intervention for the individual. The same intervention might not be suitable for all individuals. Now, we want to decide interventions that change the disease and minimize the tumor, minimize the lung cancer, eradicate it if possible, cure it. But at the same time, we don't also want to harm the patient. So Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, chemotherapy might cause interstitial lung disease in some individuals and not others, or cardiotoxicity. So how can we assess how, how the individual is doing as they're being treated with, with various approaches, uh, nutrition, lifestyle, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and all of that? So we built this platform that takes uh, CT images and convert them into these nice pictorial segmentations that show the individual's uh, body habitus in great detail. So we have skeletal muscle and uh, lungs, of course, the heart, the aorta, the, the liver, the spleen, uh, and so on, and kidneys, uh, the bone, everything is sort of segmented. And our vision is to provide this very detailed, comprehensive assessment of the individual's body habitus, which has a lot of applications in many, many different domains. And, and we can you know, generate these information to sort, sort of show that BMI, which is commonly used as a measure of obesity or so on, is not really that accurate, as you all know. Uh, same BMI for these four individuals, but um, if you look at, how do I move these out of the way? Yeah. If you look at these four individuals, you know the skeletal muscle is quite different among these four individuals. Here's 17 liters for this individual, 25 liters for this individual, 16 liters here, and 12 liters here. And this has implications for what kind of treatment is, is selected for these individuals and how they would fare under that treatment. The liver volumes are different and all of these play a role. The body is a massive puzzle of interconnected parts and everything talks to everything. There's the uh, liver bone axis, there's the kidney cardio axis, there's brain gut axis, everything is connected. So we cannot just you know, look at the tumor in isolation. We also have to look at the host along with the tumor and that's what we're trying to quantify from these images. So we can now focus more from diagnosis, which is important, to prognosis and, and build models that will predict not just the current state, but also what could happen based on these measurements in the future uh, and, and focus more on progression. And this, I think, is something I want to highlight more and more is the progression of the individual as they're undergoing therapy, how different organs and tissues change as uh, potential uh, treatments are provided to them. So here is a segmentation of a low-dose uh, CT from a screening CT program. And even though the low-dose CTs are uh, you know, sort of lower contrast and lower quality than conventional CTs, the, the automation that, uh, that we have with AI can now segment these very, very nicely, very accurately. And let me show you a, a slide through, through a low-dose CT. So here's low-dose CT. Um, okay. And so we can now look at all these organs and tissues, and I'm going to scroll through this from the bottom. So this is over here in the bottom. And as I scroll through this uh, CT, and as we go up from the bottom to the top, 
you can sort of see the kidneys here, the spleen, the liver, the visceral adipose tissue, the subcutaneous in blue over here, the skeletal muscle, the bones, the aorta, and, and so much information is present that has massive ramifications and many, many different application areas. The lungs, of course, and as you come into the heart, you can see the epicardial fat in green, the pericardial fat in blue. And as we go up, further up, <clears throat> we can see the thoracic fat come over that's above the heart region and so on. So there's a ton of information present here. And another individual over here, you can see lots and lots of information present. You can quantify the amount of belly fat in great detail, very accurately, along with the heart region. So a chest CT is not just a, a record of the lung. It's also, as you know, we are measuring the heart and the muscle and the bones and parts of the liver and spleen. And if you add a few more inches, you can get the whole kidneys and the pancreas as well. So a lot of information in these in these images that we can quantify. So what can we do with this? So what can we do with this is I think the crown jewel of body composition is within patient longitudinal assessment. And so here's one individual. This is the baseline, three months, six months, one year, two years. And we want to show a case study of what is possible with these kinds of CT images, these measurements. So we can segment these images automatically. Now, this is a lot of work. It, it just cannot be done by a human reader or, you know, because it, it would take uh, on the order of, you know, many, many weeks for this kind of segmentation to be done by humans, whereas with AI running on your desktop or la laptop, it will be done in five or 10 minutes. So what can you drive from these uh, images? Well, here is percentage change in volume from baseline. So the baseline is 0%, and these different tissues we automatically can measure are plotted over time. So this is three months, six months, one year, two years. So in this individual, skeletal muscle is increasing in volume, and then it decreases a little bit of 20% increase. The liver is decreasing in volume over time, and then the left kidney and the right kidney are decreasing in volume. The spleen decreases in volume first and then increases. And why is that the case? On the heart region, epicardial fat and pericardial fat are both increasing in volume, but not uh, monotonously. They increase and then they decrease and then they increase. Subcutaneous adipose tissue, visceral adipose tissue increase, and abdominal aortic calcium increases. So a lot of information that can be harvested. And here are the percentage change in the radio density. So the radio density, the HU of uh, different tissues is sort of a measure of their, their fat infiltration in, in simplistic terms or the amount of scar tissue that they have. So in this case, we see that this individual, the skeletal muscle volume was increasing over time, but the radio density is decreasing steadily over time, indicating more fatty skeletal muscle. The left kidney was also decreasing in HU first and then increases later on. The right kidney is decreasing in HU uh, earlier, but then it doesn't follow the same pattern as the left kidney. Why is there a differential pattern among the two kidneys? Why is one kidney more fattier than the other? The liver is increasing in HU, which means more scarry liver, more scar cirrhosis or whatever, and or less fat in the liver. So there is a very active process that's dynamically remodeling the body with these different tissues and organs changing dramatically over a very short period of time. Like we sort of tend to think that you know, when these tissues and organs are fixed or changing very slowly, but the information that CT gives us shows that it's really, really active and very, very dynamic. So here's four individuals. We saw this one individual earlier. This is a male and there's another male and two females. And you can look at the percentage change of volumes and they paint a very different picture for every patient. Every patient is different. So in this individual, epicardial fat was increasing more than pericardial fat. <clears throat> In this individual, pericardial fat is increasing more than epicardial fat. In this individual, skeletal muscle was increasing in volume. In this individual, skeletal muscle is decreasing in volume first. Here, the liver was decreasing in volume. Here, the liver is increasing in volume. <laughs> Excuse me. Here, here spleen is decreasing in volume in this individual. Here, the spleen was increasing first and then decreasing. There's this amazing detail of you know, changes that, are, that show that every individual is very unique. Here are two females. In this one individual, the abdominal aortic calcium measure of cardiac health is just going increasing off the chart, so why is that the case? And then we look at radio densities, the amount of fat in different organs and tissues. In this individual, the skeletal muscle was decreasing in volume, uh, decreasing radio density, more fatty muscle. Here also it decreases first, and then it starts increasing. So the fat was being deposited earlier, and now fat is maybe leaving the skeletal muscle. Here the liver is decreasing in HU, so more fatty liver first, and then reduces and increases. Here the liver is increasing in HU. So very, very different patterns of, uh, of tissue volumes and the radio densities that can give us a lot of information about individual health and wellness and allow us to predict future, uh, future events, adverse events potentially, and also monitor the progression of these organs and tissues as a function of intervention. 
how is chemotherapy changing the individual? How is surgery, nutrition, lifestyle, exercise, all those changing individuals? So the, the holy grail, is, as I see it, is that we can now look at these tissues and organs and their measurements and put them into AI system that will learn from the data in, in the retrospective cohorts that are well characterized and allow us to present to the individual not just what they are today, but the potential route they will, their health could take, their body could take in the future, integrating all the intervention that are potentially going to be provided to them. And, and, and so then we can go back go from a priori assumptions to learning from data. What is the individual telling us and what organs and tissues are important in various, uh, various intervention scenarios? So here uh, is the summary slide. We can generate a lot of these uh, organ reports. And these, as we were discussing yesterday, are important as well, potentially for patient engagement. When you present this beautiful set of uh, you know, measurements in very visual terms, then patients get excited about their health and excited about these, uh, these kinds of interventions, these kind of screening, imaging, or, you know, things that they have to go to. These can help us select optimal interventions for the patient, the right dose, the right patient, the right time. Not every patient can be given the same treatment. And, and we can also then look at prognosis of adverse events, what will happen down the line in the future, as well as, and I think this is really important, monitoring organs for progressive change from disease interventions. And this is what uh, I think is potentially missing in, in, from these images today, the images I looked at qualitatively, but quantitative assessment of organ changes and in, 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 as a function of intervention is, is potentially something very exciting and powerful that can be extracted from these images. And the usual markers of emphysema and, and uh, adverse cardiac events and metabolic assessments, sarcopenia, breastbone, and kidney semen, so much as possible from these screen CT images right now. So with that, I'll end my talk. and. Uh, and it will you. So thank you, David, for this opportunity. Our next uh, panelist is Dr. Susan Freed uh, from Mount Sinai. Uh, Susan, please. Uh... Thank you, David. And, and, and I, I really appreciate the uh, very good introduction of the previous uh, speaker to our, um, to our, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, good. Um, so if you could please show my slides. So I, I, as our previous speaker pointed out um, that um, adipose tissue is distributed throughout the body. It, not only the total quantity of, of, of adipose mass in the body, but also the quality of that adipose tissue is a clear risk factor for multiple diseases, including cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And, and I think there's clearly, a, 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 as David um, has implied, um, a, a real opportunity to, um, to uh, incidental imaging of adipose tissue when you're doing screening. Is, is it a really extraordinary opportunity? And what people are doing now is, is, um, is, is looking at the quality as well as the quantity of fat. Quantity of fat is, is one thing, it's pretty crude, but from the CT, you can get the attenuation of that fat and therefore its quality, um, the different size of fat cells. So these, these are the ma major um, depots in the, um, adipo in, in the body of, of humans. And I'll just point out that there are two major visceral adipose tissue depots that are associated with metabolic health. Um, and, and these are associated with the digestive tract. Um, Subcutaneous so adipose tissue, um, you know, we tend to, <laughs> in, 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 in the obesity field, I'm actually at an obesity meeting in San Diego, um, you know, we tend to focus um, on, on the major subcutaneous depots, but um, there, there's also accumulation of fat in many other organs. Um, if you can proceed to the next slide. Um, it, it's, actually, can you go back one second? I'm sorry. Thank you very much. So it's really important to to realize that um, there are, as the previous speaker pointed out, there there are smaller depots which are very organ specific, um, very elegant studies are very early on by Caroline Fox in in the Framingham uh, Health Study showed that she could look with CT at the density of the adipose tissue and therefore infer its quality. Adipose tissue is 14% water and that varies, can vary widely with, uh, with, um, with, with metabolic health. Um, and 
the, the particular size of, of specific depots in these minor uh, places is, is really important. These depots are, are developmentally distinct. They are metabolically distinct. And I think with AI, we can learn a lot about the quality of adipose tissue as long as in addition to its quantity. Total body fat is not a great predictor. It's where the fat is in the body and its particular association with different organs that, um, that impacts uh, total uh, metabolic health. So if you can proceed to the next slide. And then um, this just shows very similar to, um, to what the previous speaker said, but you know, they're, you know, perivascular fat, pancreatic fat. These, these are, you know, can clearly be used to um, in, infer differences in metabolic health. And what this slide emphasizes is that metabolically healthy obese individuals might have a lot of subcutaneous fat. Uh, metabolically unhealthy individuals um, have a, a paucity of uh, subcutaneous fat and more visceral fat. And But over and above that, the quality of that fat is, is really what's critical to metabolic health. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a, another example of uh, you know, epicardial fat, as the previous speaker uh, mentioned. Um, so final slide. Can, can you go to the next slide, please? So you're not going to get this in, in a lung cancer screening, but this is just a DEXA that shows a very important um, aspect of um, fat distribution and, and obesity to some extent, that, but it's largely independent of obesity. It is now uh, fairly well established that the, the fat above the waist, subcutaneous as well as visceral, um, is um, deleterious to metabolic health, whereas literally there is a protective effect of lower body fat. And even though you may not capture this in a, in, in a screen of, of, of lungs, um, uh, physicians, it's not that you know, um, difficult to, um, look at the shape of the individual, and there are many ways to do that. So body shape is really important. It's linked to metabolic disease. It's the, the studies on cancer are not as extensive, but, they, but they're, you know, they're beginning to show um, very interesting things. So the diversity of fat, the quality of fat, as well as the quantity of fat is very important. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Susan. I just wanna say that I, I listened to a lecture that Susan gave uh, at Mount Sinai about fat and fat distribution, and it was absolutely eye-opening for me. And, and you're hearing sort of some of that here, just how important it is and, and, and our ability to measure it. Uh, and, and this is just gonna improve and how it impacts wellness as well as even prognosis for disease. It, it's just incredible. Um, next speaker is uh, Raj Sareen, who's the CEO of Staiku. Uh, and this is a, really a, Fascinating new technology, and I'm sure he'll uh, enlighten us all about uh, how he's doing with this and his personal story also. Maybe he can share a little bit of that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Yes. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so um, as David said, my name is Raj Serene. I'm the CEO and uh, founder of Staiku. And... Uh, we have developed a uh, non-invasive imaging technique to predict uh, all sorts of risks of non-communicable diseases and health outcomes. Uh, essentially, the mission of our company is to turn the tide on growing obesity. Uh, as we all know uh, how uh, unfortunate it is that we're dealing with this problem, not only in the United States, but uh, the growing um, uh, epidemic of obesity uh, all over the world. Uh, and so um, what we really focus on are, are a few different problems, and I'll get to that uh, in a moment here. Um, uh, but first, uh, a little bit about our company. So let's see here. Uh, again, I am the CEO and founder, but I have a senior leadership team, which spans uh, all sorts of different disciplines, uh, mainly just talking about myself here. My background, uh, as David um, alluded to is in, uh, in physics and space sciences. I spent many years actually as an astronomer in the early part of my career. Uh, and I was fortunate at that time uh, while working at NASA and then later on um, doing research funded by NASA and NSF, I was uh, fortunate to 
acquire a lot of skills around image uh, acquisition, image analysis, uh, around various um, different um, uh, techniques uh, and, and different parts of the spectrum. Um, fast forward many years later, when I became an entrepreneur, it turned out uh, uh, one of those uh, skill sets ended up being helpful uh, in designing uh, what essentially is called a body scanner, um, or in the literature, as they call it, a 3D optical imager. Uh, I was initially designing this for the clothing industry. <laughs> and so like a lot of uh, inventions, um, uh, it ended up being accidental that I discovered its impact in healthcare. Uh, and so I'll spare you the, the, the long uh, story, uh, but um, after years of uh, building the startup in the clothing space and failing to find good product market fit, we ended up doing a lot of uh, uh, market research and business development in uh, the gym space. Uh, and then later on that turned into not only the gym space, but with physical therapists, nutritions, uh, hospitals, uh, and uh, primary care. Uh, and then today we have over 1500 locations uh, in the, you know, in, mainly in North America, but globally we're in 50 different countries. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what our solution entails, um, but we are we have the we have the uh, fortune of being able to work across preventative care today. So from a like I said, from a full service health club or a boutique fitness establishment all the way to a hospital. Mount Sinai, for example, uh, like David mentioned, uses uh, our system. And I I do want to say thank you, David, for for volunteering to be the idealized uh, male body. <laughs> we appreciate that <laughs> and the sacrifice <laughs> you made. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Just uh, Mount Sinai and, uh, has been using our system over the last uh, couple of years now, and, and they're uh, using it in, in many different forms, especially their concierge practice. And we've seen an incredible growth in healthcare over the last couple of years, uh, certainly accelerated by, by COVID, but the the desire to use screening technology that's not invasive, that's quick, that's low friction for a consumer, and and uh, has has uh, expansive reach. Um, <clears throat> we've done 1.2 million. Sorry, we've done 2.2 million scans in, in across the last five years, and we have uh, 1.2 million users today. And uh, a lot of our our product and our services have been scientifically validated, and you can learn more about that on staiku.com slash research. And I'll talk a little bit about, I think, some of the more important scientific uh, findings uh, later in, in my uh, slides. So here's, again, just a visual map of the locations around the country. Uh, later uh, around the world, uh, later uh, next year, we'll be rolling out in every equinox uh, in, the, in the country as well. So I think that's a big ac accomplishment for our team because it's creating a lot of awareness of our, our technology. <clears throat> so the problem as we see it is a little, it's a little bit of a more, a little bit of a broader approach that we have. Um, we see three, three main problems that are, are sort of preventing, you know, our, our country from turning the tide on obesity. Um, the first is health literacy. Um, well, this is out of order, so I'll do it in a different, I'll do it in a different order. But the first then would be uh, uh, health awareness, right? And so we talk about screening technology. Uh, I was there, uh, I assume most of you were there at the, at the beginning of this workshop in the first talk around lung cancer screening. Uh, and then, you know, just to uh, piggyback off this, some of the presentations that came before me around CT and MRIs and just medical imaging, it's incredible how much information you can gather from medical imaging today. It's, in, and you couple that with AI and like the gentleman said, it's very uh, it's very easy within you know five minutes, especially when you have some sort of longitudinal or temporal data set to see how the body is transforming um, over over the course of time. The problem, as we see it, is that most people don't get medical imaging until it's too late, right? Um, uh, it's not a preventative technique that people would actually go to the hospital and get medical imaging, though that's changing. And there's some startups in Silicon Valley that are offering medical imaging as a service. It can cost upwards of $2,000 um, out of pocket uh, per scan. Um, on the other side of the spectrum of health screening technology, the, um, uh, the earlier part of the presentation, the review, all the different consumer 
methods today and, and consumer uh, wearables and whatnot is providing an incredible amount of data um, in totality. Um, the problem is that most people don't know how to take all those devices and all those techniques. They don't necessarily take the initiative to, to do all those things. Uh, and then certainly if they did, they're not sure how to assemble all of that information to understand what their total health is at any uh, any given time. So the biggest one of the biggest problems is people don't know their health at any particular time, and they often don't find out until symptoms of some non-communicable diseases have presented themselves, and maybe treatment is the only option at that point. Prevention may be not something that they uh, is not an option. Even even before we would understand the state of our own health, the other thing that we discovered is, uh, you know, through all these businesses that we work with, is that most people don't even know what healthy means. Uh, there was a survey done by um, the Washington Post on obesity, and they found that half of people that are obese today don't know that they're obese. So how do you solve a problem if you don't know you have one? Um, and then even just communicating body fat percentage, for example, uh, as the presenter before me had, had illustrated, knowing what visceral fat is, is incredibly important and the, the quality of the fat that's in your body uh, and how can it impact your health. Uh, but who's educating you on this, right? Um, and most people, if you tell them that their visceral fat is X, it just goes right over their head, right? And so there's a literacy to health that just, I, 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 um, I aken to I aken it to uh, personal finance. Really, not a lot of people learn, you know, in education, in formal education, how to manage their money, and that's something that's a life skill. And in many ways, understanding your health, right, and how to di diagnose an issue or how to screen for an issue, really has become a life skill that is ultimately <clears throat> ultimately a privilege based on you know where you know where you grow up in this country, right. Um, so that's a that's that's a massive issue, and the la last but not least, even if you know the state of your own health, right, and you know what healthy means, right, changing behavior is incredibly hard, right. Lifestyle modification is very hard, and who's who's responsible for lifestyle modification, right? Um, we talked about primary care and <clears throat> visits. I mean, uh, you're lucky if somebody <laughs> goes to a uh, a, a primary care a primary care physician once a year and gets a physical done, and in those thirty minutes, I'm not sure that the physician has the time, nor does the physician necessarily have the training to really talk about their lifestyle and and suggest how to modify it. So um, those are the gaps that we found <clears throat> in the uh, in the healthcare space that we think that we can help fill, and we're, we're filling to some degree. So the way we do it is we've discovered that an infrared sensor, uh, which is non-invasive, uh, near infrared, no different than the infrared light that's coming from the sun or, or the infrared light coming from your remote control, uh, has the ability to map out the surface of the body, the shell of the body. And so by doing so, you get these really rich anthropometrics that nobody has really uh, ever um, accumulated at scale, right? Um, we all know the waist circumference in, a, in the literature, how important the waist circumference is and how it can be so predictive of health outcomes, but it does require some manipulation of a, of a, me, of a, a measuring tape, which uh, unfortunately is not widely done and is not widely done accurately. But when you do capture the shell or the surface of the body, you can take not only the waist circumference, but you can take an infinite number of circumferences around the body. Uh, and you can take surface areas, you can take volumes, Ultimately, what you what we saw around CT and MRI scans around, and DEXA around medical imaging and the internals of a body, uh, what we often say is the surface of your body is is in somewhat a map of what's going on inside. Although it's not a rich as or nearly as rich or detailed as a medical uh, imaging device, we know that subcutaneous fat under the skin, if you accumulate too much, will cause the body to expand. And we know that it'll expand in certain areas based on your age and your gender. So we're able to see the extent and the, uh, and the influence of, uh, uh, of uh, high body fat percentage, essentially, um, and use that to predict um, certain health outcomes. We have an enterprise software as well that physicians will use in order to analyze this data and the biometrics 
Uh, and, and the biometrics are pretty expansive, as you saw in David's uh, uh, report. Um, they span circumferences, surface areas, volumes, but also um, full body composition, visceral fat, subcutaneous fat. Can't get further in terms of the quality just yet. I know there's a lot of great science out there. Um, and it's all based on this AI uh, or any kind of regression model that we've created where we've done validation studies with the output of a DEXA or some criterion method uh, used in, in that area. The only thing that's really explicitly measured are the anthropometrics around circumferences, surface areas, and, and volumes. But the predictive value we found um, is incredibly powerful. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the things that we recently did was a study um, and an industry report. And we wanted to kind of determine, because we can measure change, um, and this is ultimately uh, one of the most important parts of our value proposition, uh, as, as he, uh, earlier the gentleman uh, had presented uh, some of the time series of somebody's body shape, we can do the same thing. And what we discovered, uh, at least from the surface of the body, um, over the course of all of last year and 1,600 locations, there were 364,000 scans done. And almost half a million pounds were lost um, as measured by our device. We also have a rotating weight scale, uh, and that's how we take the uh, 3D scan. They spin around. It takes 35 seconds to do the test. They have to wear some sort of form-fitting clothing. We also capture their weight beyond their, um, uh, you know, their circumferences and areas. But what we discovered is that these, the people that had gotten scanned, there was a total inch loss uh, in the mid torso across three different waist circumferences um, of uh, a quarter of a million inches. And so for this, we know from the literature, losing inches, losing weight does correlate with better health outcomes. So this is, uh, you know, this sort of technique is being used across, like I said, um, 15, 1600 locations. And what we are essentially getting is a real-time clinical trial of all of these different businesses, right, and their products and services, whether it's a nutritionist uh, meal plan or it's a physical therapist and they're um, you know, their physical therapy uh, program for a particular patient, or whether it's a personal trainer and the fitness program that they created, or it's a, it's a medical weight loss program, right, um, uh, administered by a physician. We're essentially able to, to judge the efficacy of all these programs uh, at scale as people use the technology. And now we're getting, um, we're using this data to build all sorts of business intelligence tools to help these businesses iterate on their products and services. Uh, for example, the health of physician test out a medical weight loss drug and get a, you know, a real-time estimate of how well it's performing. Um, some of the important studies that I think I wanted to highlight here in my talk, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, number one is we've been validated as a tool to predict full body composition with about 98% accuracy. Um, and I encourage you to read this paper by Bennett. Uh, AL um, uh, that's on stipe.com slash research. Uh, and that forms really uh, the basis for a lot of what we do as far as health outcomes. Uh, and the second is, is another study that was just published in the BCD journal uh, where we have built uh, a tool where we can predict metabolic syndrome with 92% accuracy, which is a few percentage points better than the uh, BMI, than using just BMI alone, BMI, age, ethnicity, gender, um, alone. Um, and, uh, and so the anthropometrics, having some additional anthropometrics on the surface of the body, uh, certainly has helped to increase the accuracy of predicting metabolic syndrome. And as all of you likely know, uh, metabolic syndrome impacts uh, one third of all Americans. It's a precursor to a lot of these non-communicable diseases. So being able to screen for it um, in a better way, in five seconds, we think has a lot of value as opposed to the criterion method, which would be to do blood work, to do, do a blood panel, um, take your blood pressure, um, measure your waist circumference, uh, which again, preventatively, most people don't do, even if you were going to visit your doctor to do a physical in uh, 30 minutes, it's not likely you'd get that information without another visit to go get it, uh, blood work done anyhow. So um, this is something we're going to be releasing as a tool in our software um, sometime next year. And we think it's going to be very powerful because we're going to get a sense of the uh, the vector of this particular syndrome uh, across, um, 
you know, across uh, the country and across uh, lots of different uh, countries in the globe. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to end here with just a visual of the scan. Let's see if I can, I'm gonna try to do this really quick here. I have a nice example here that I thought I'd show you all. And let's see here. Right, there we go. So this is an example progress report. Uh, I think it'd be nice to show you a little bit about what the data looks like. And I do want to point out that uh, visually, when people see themselves in a before and after, like David mentioned, very motivating. Um, and like he mentioned, a picture is worth a thousand words. That that was, again, not something that was our intent, but we discovered accidentally that, uh, number one, when people see their shape, they're all, it almost resets their expectations of, of their, their own health. Uh, it turns out people very much judge their own health with how they look, uh, but they don't usually have a, a good idea of how they really, really look. And I think that um, we're sort of trained biologically to present the best version of ourselves to others and ourselves. Um, and so this is the first objective 3D view that people have, and it's disappointing to everyone, even if they're in fantastic shape. Um, uh, people tend to look at flaws in their body. And it's not meant, obviously, to shame somebody or, or to, you know, make them feel disappointed, but it starts the conversation in a preventative care setting around, you know, where people think. Place. About, I think, about, Raj, that's a good place. We, we've got to, I think sure. you, you hit the high notes. Um, so we're going to take some, uh, I'm going to provide some questions to the panelists. Thank you so much. That was really a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I wanted to. Uh, which, you know, I, I don't think many of us really think about, but these techniques and, and their value, um, I, I'd love to get some, some of your feedback on some of the, the talks you've heard, uh, some of the visualizations, how useful, it, how useful this is going to be in terms of, uh, you know, following people's health, following progress of illness, predictive values, et cetera, for different illnesses. Uh, I, I could just comment that that body shape is a much more important, likely a, a much more important predictor. Um, and there are subtleties that it appears that uh, with AI and certainly with the technology that Raj talked about that can capture body shape. Um, it does does buttock fat, you know, some people it's large, it's small. And, and if you look at the person and you just measure their waist and their hip, you'll get a ratio. But that's not as good as getting the actual shape. Some people will have a large buttock. Some people will have um, larger thighs. Some people will have larger abdomens. And that might be secretaneous or visceral fat. And you know, using AI and additionally looking at, at when you're looking at CTs, the size and the um, fibrosis in the adipose tissue is, is what determines metabolic health. Um, and being able to get that granularity, uh, which you can do with, with AI, it's, there, there have been actually several talks at this obesity meeting about using the, the quality of the fat from uh, imaging analysis as a predictor of metabolic health, which I think you have an extraordinary opportunity to do. And what about quality of muscle? Uh, oh, I absolutely. You quality yes. of fat. What about quality of muscle? Um, you're absolutely right, and and um, so the and that's a function of the amount of um, of fat deposited in the muscle, as well as um, uh, other features of the of the muscle and 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 where it is. Um, but I think it's an, important to point out that. Um, uh, you know, body composition is really um, complicated, um, and uh, and you you need to look at all aspects of it and integrate those in, in a way that I think without AI would be extremely difficult to do. Pancreatic fat might be really important. You know, having an islet surrounded by adipose tissue, which might be infiltrated with macrophages or not, good or bad ones, and is very very dynamic. Um, is important to to really determine. There's migration of cells, 
from bone marrow into other tissues, accumulated specific tissues, and this undoubtedly predicts risk for metabolic disease. You know, I had a, a conversation with one of our senior clinicians over at Mount Sinai who uses this, uh, this, this Stiku, and, uh, and he was telling me that uh, he talks about metabolic syndrome with all the patients that he gets. He's become very good at predicting who has it, who's unaware of it. He even uses it to predict sleep apnea, and he looks at the size of their neck, and he talks about uh, and well, absolutely. probes, and he's found a lot of people uh, who didn't know that they had sleep apnea, and, and he, he picks up on it. And, and in terms of getting people to lose weight, change in body appearance, he said it's just unbelievable how impactful it is. So I, I think it, you know, these images have- I would actually question how much, how good that data is, that it's actually an impact, that actually knowing these facts will, will um, change behavior. That's one of the biggest problems in the obesity field, the me oh, metabolic health field, I'll say. Well, what he said to me was he's, you know, he has patients for years, tells them lose weight, lose weight, this, that, their blood tests. And he says, as soon as he shows them their picture, they can't believe that this is what they look like. And, uh, and that, that when he shows them that, that image of their body, he says that that motivates them more than anything he has ever seen. Now, listen, this is anecdotal, but I, I'm, yeah, you know, but it, it, it was surprising to me, I, I have to say. Um, in terms of, you know, what we do with lung screening, you know, we have this tremendous opportunity here you know, the, the ability to, to see epicardial fat, pericardial fat, subcutaneous fat, you know, I mean, Faisal, I'm sure your dream is that uh, we're doing this on every scan and, and saying, you know, we're going to find, you know, who's got, you know, we're doing a lung screen and we're going to tell people, uh, you know, hey, you, you have metabolic syndrome. Uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is where, you know, the potential of all this goes now. I mean, there's so many other things that you can use it for as well, right? You know, David, quality my, of muscle. This, yeah, and the excitement is that we will discover things that we never actually knew were important because there was no technology to look at them. And now we finally have, and with the granularity that CT provides, the 3D measurements, the location, uh, the organ ectopic fat depositions, this will allow us to discover really, it's like, it's like we're living in the 15th century with Magellan, getting on a ship, we've just built a ship, now sailing west to come back east. And that's the, that's the, that's the excitement of this field. We have the ship now. It's, a, it's a now an invitation for scientists to journey and discover new lands. That's where we are. You know, one of the things that I've always wondered about um, with this is, you know, we, we're, we're learning to measure things. Do we know what normal is? Do we know what to tell people what's normal for them? I know, I know Raj, you've tried to come up with measures of this. And, 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 and that's really important. You know, people like to see where they are, but do we know, you know, and you can see this going into, you know, when people are getting treated for illness, what you expect is their muscle quality gonna go down? Is their liver gonna, you know, increase, decrease? Do we, do we have any clue uh, as to, you know, or is this just a, an information vacuum at this point? There's a big information vacuum, David. Uh, I mean, a lot of these measurements are dependent on sex. Males and females, females are different. They're dependent on race and ethnicity and ancestry and age. And so what we are trying to do is now build an international consortium of people who contribute CT scans from around the world because we want to build this normative as, as it applies to different, different countries. So India is different from China, is different from Europe, is different from Canada and North America. So it's really a, a now an exciting time to build these normative databases of what is normal for different ages, sexes, and different ethnic and races, and then build on top of that to give the individual a sense of where they are with, with respect to normative. I mean, I've even seen articles saying that, that just measurements of muscle mass are the most predictive of, of how people will do with their lung cancers. You know, that's the best prognostic indicator as to how... how, how you know, so that's how powerful these these techniques are um, in terms of we're just scratching the surface of where we're heading with this. Um, we're close to the end. Any final comments from each of the panel members? Susan? No, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good summary, and I think it's highlighted the topic and the potential. Raj? Yeah, I'll just I'll add one point there to build on Susan's point. I think you're absolutely right. Just seeing your body alone is not going to lead to better health outcomes. However, 
it does help the practitioner or the trainer or the nutritionist um, start to build that awareness. Like as David says, it's very motivating, but it ultimately comes down to changing behavior. And so uh, that's ultimately why we're seeing better health outcomes with our technologies, because it's in the hands of the nutritionist, the physical therapist, the physician that's working on modifying lifestyle. And that's a very important Thanks. part of preventative care is, is, is Faisal. Oh, sorry. Faisal, any final comment? Uh, so uh, just building on your last comment, uh, muscle is known to be important. And the reason I think is because people were only looking at muscle. I think if you look at other organs, you might find uh, some, you know, constellation of other organs might as might be even more important or more powerful. But this is an exciting time. There's lots to be done, lots of discovery ahead. And thank you for the opportunity to present it. Thank you all the panelists. This was a enlightening session. Okay.